I've titled this presentation what uh, every software engineer should know about generative AI, which is of course a very ambitious title, but uh, at least I'll make an attempt uh, at showing you that generative AI is of great relevance for software engineering already today. And uh, I'll expose you to some useful uh, tools and techniques. So we'll do this in uh, four parts, multiple steps, starting from an overview of what's going on, discussing techniques and principles for uh, effective use of generative AI, and then digging into concrete ways uh, we can use and uh, build upon large language models as uh, software engineers. So do this uh, story in uh, two iterations. We'll pass over all these four parts again um, later with the, the different focuses. But the first iteration is today. So the first thing one should know about uh, generative AI is that it's like a tidal wave just uh, bearing down on us. You, you, you should have such an image as this in your, in your head when you're thinking about generative AI. AI is of course not new, but uh, the current wave is a big one. So this form of AI, often called generative AI, uh, represents an enormous opportunity for software engineers. As you just shall see, there's a gigantic opportunity for becoming a more efficient developer or programmer, and there are colossal opportunities to build new impactful software on top of generative AI. In terms of public attention, this uh, current wave really started with the, the release of ChatGPT. As you all know, uh, now we have a powerful publicly available chatbot that can write, discuss and uh, reason as if human. You, you can ask it questions, ask for feedback and discuss almost any topic. And, and you only need to play with this for a little bit before you realize that it's quite powerful. Of course, you can also study um, its power and ask questions like how creative are the responses you get from the system. And turns out it's uh, pretty, pretty darn creative, at least for certain tasks and uh, certain definitions and measures of creativity. Here we see the result of uh, one such study where you see that uh, humans were outperformed by, by AI, in this case, uh, GPT-4. Another finding that keeps uh, popping up in all these uh, studies is that uh, actually the, the lower skilled people get a relatively larger boost from using this kind of AI uh, that compared to the top uh, performing uh, people, but they all get boosts. And the systems are also very useful. So you can you you can measure these boosts right in these uh, double digits percentages for for certain tasks and uh, and certain measures, but but again you don't have to play with this uh, this system a lot before you realize that actually in uh, many cases the boosts are much greater than that depending on what you already know and what you bring to the task yourself. So uh, it's quite clear then now that uh, there's a an effectiveness boost and uh, that these uh, systems are quite creative. Okay, so we have a system that can write and discuss as if human. Midjourney is uh, another AI system based on similar principles uh, where you also give it sort of a kind of an order, uh, uh, a so-called prompt. So you write some text of what you want and then the task of the, this AI is to generate illustrations or pictures that uh, sort of fit uh, your order, what you wrote, your prompt. Okay, and if you change the prompt, you, you change the output. So you can ask for what you want and it's the task of the AI is to give it to you. And to get good results, you need to be quite good at prompting, writing good prompts, right? Um, and that takes some uh, knowledge and some creativity. And who has creativity and knowledge? Well, ChatGPT has creativity and knowledge. So you can, of course, combine these systems. So here you see a prompt that was made by ChatGPT after I told it like how Midjourney works and the pra best practices or principles for using Midjourney. 
and look at the detailed prompt coming up here, right? Uh, of exactly what should be in the illustration and also the camera setup, like technical uh, lighting settings and uh, focus and uh, all these kind of things that I didn't come up with at all. And then Mid Journey has to generate this. And you, you get uh, you get then quite uh, impressive results. And uh, this is of course something you can iterate on and, and play around with. So here I asked for variations of one of the images I liked and say we liked the top left one. And then we ask uh, Mid Journey to upscale this. So now we have a, a quite high quality uh, illustration made by Mid Journey helped by ChatGPT. And this task of writing good prompts, formulating good prompts to use with this kind of AI is uh, a challenging task. It actually has a name called prompt engineering. And it's not just a name, it's actually a job title now. And you, you can get a job as a prompt engineer if you're good at uh, asking or giving these uh, AIs orders, uh, you can get paid doing that. So that's new. Okay, so we can create pictures and illustrations. It doesn't stop there, of course. Here's another AI system called Stable Audio, where based on the same principle, you give it like a prompt, an order. I give it this. And then uh, the task is now to make music that fits with this. So we can have a listen. And if you change the prompt, you change the music coming out, of course. So here's another uh, output. And again, we can have ChatGPT do the heavy lifting, right? We can tell ChatGPT about how this stable audio works, uh, how to use it. And uh, in this case, I, I more or less just uh, copy the instructions uh, from the stable audio website on how to use it and uh, the instructions aren't very detailed so I, I can't I can't uh, give ChatGPT lots of details on how to best use this system because the details aren't there but I, but I can copy what we know and then we can uh, also give it some uh, examples of uh, prompts that tend to generate nice music and this is exactly the same uh, principle that uh, we used for Midjourney earlier, where we took the, the best practices of Midjourney and gave it to ChatGPT plus some examples, and then and then uh, had it generate images. You can do the same for for uh, for the audio, stable audio. So I, you see, I, I'm just selecting a few example prompts that were given in the documentation that seemed to be kind of detailed and maybe interesting. So I think I give it four of these and then, or five, and then the, then uh, now I've given uh, ChatGPT the task of generating such prompts, right? Um, uh, based on my simple order to ChatGPT. So now I can ask like, uh, 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 create a happy tune, right? And based on the best practices and example prompts I've given it, here's a highly detailed prompt for generating a happy tune using stable audio. So look at the details here, right? It's much more than what I told, put into ChatGPT. So it's translated into this. So let's have a listen. And you can continue with this, right? So ask it for a very creative and strange uh, but interesting sound or interesting uh, melody. Um, and then, okay, it has to translate this into something that it thinks stable audio will uh, make good use of. And you see it coming up with these keywords, probably something I wouldn't have come up with myself. And, and uh, yeah. We can try it out. It's gonna be strange, right? <laughs> but uh, interesting, hopefully. 
because that's the task we gave it. Yeah, so we have something that can create music. And if we can create music, we can create speech, we can create avatars. Hi students, I'm Natalie. I'm an AI avatar created entirely by artificial intelligence, speaking words chosen by Alexander. Modern AI makes it easy to create such avatars. Something to be aware of. And these can get pretty good. As you probably are aware, the quality of the speech uh, in these avatars or this fake speech can be so good that humans cannot reliably detect the difference between fake and real speech. So we can create artificial people. And uh, all these things can of course be combined. In fact, the most powerful model currently, the, the one powering uh, ChatGPT plus is uh, GPT-4 and it is inherently multimodal. It can process both images and text simultaneously. And uh, here are some examples, recognizing and uh, transcribing like ancient texts. Okay, that works. Uh, helping us make our photographs better. That's possible. And much, much more. So here are some uh, examples from uh, OpenAI. You have some AI system that reads medical images as, a, as if a radiologist is reading it and generating a report. Um, AI detecting uh, uh, mistakes or some, something wrong with the with an object, so like in an industrial process, audio insurance and, uh, and much more. So it's very far away from being perfect, but it works surprisingly well. Here's another system that exists uh, combining text and uh, images, in this case oh, OpenAI's GPT-4 plus uh, DALI-3 from OpenAI combined in the, in the Bing chat. Okay, so we can ask for, for example, an advertisement uh, of Net for Netflix in the style of a poster by Alfonso Mucha. And we can ask it to do extensive research and make sure it's sort of translating the modern ad into this style. Um, and you see it doing research here and uh, finding references and uh, looking up stuff online, right? To figure out how it can create this um, advertisement for Netflix in this uh, very particular style that you see it uh, figure out uh, how what that style is by by looking it up and you get links so you can check out you get the inline links and you get them down there okay so it found also the logo of netflix and here we are some suggestions for uh, advertisements for netflix in this style so now you can um Okay, okay th those are ideas that you can sort of play further with. Here's an, uh, a, a tip and a, a technique that works with these kind of models, um, uh, all these generative AI models. Uh, iterate together with them, give, th give it back what it gave you. So I, I gave it here the image that it just gave me and ask it to criticize it and maybe even score it on a scale, scale from zero to 100 according to some reasonable criteria that I just made up. Um, and you see, okay, so it's criticizing its own image and actually scoring it. Good, okay, so you get some feedback on the image uh, provided then by, by Bing. And uh, you can then take this feedback and then improve, improve it yourself, perhaps, if you, if you think the feedback is good and the ideas are good. Or you can, of course, just ask it to create, to take all this criticism into account and and create another image that maximizes the score on all these criteria. So of course, why not have it do it itself? And in this case, what it uh, comes up with is uh, this, these examples. Okay, and then, yeah, you may uh, like them or not, but at least it's an interesting process of generating stuff. So there's another example uh, of combining uh, different uh, AI systems, generative AI systems. So uh, let's have a look at this. So 
you can probably guess where that's uh, going. So when you see and digest sort of these examples and then more, you tend to have multiple reactions simultaneously from like, wow, to yay, to uh oh, how is this gonna be okay? And this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are, there are many other competing AI solutions that do the same uh, tasks, uh, like uh, chatbots, and generating images, generating music, and so on, and other similar tasks. Uh, and the field is still in its infancy. This is quite new. Uh, but things are then continuously percolating to the top. So if you, if you want to just uh, choose one trend that it's uh, particularly important to be aware of, something you should definitely keep an eye on is that these things are being integrated into existing tools and products. Products that have widespread use like Office. A billion users or so of Office products. Um, and now uh, Microsoft is creating co-pilots, AI-based co-pilots for Office products and uh, Windows. So that means when integrated with your work in using Word or email program Outlook or Teams or Excel or whatever, you have AI support. And this is able then to pull in information from across all the different uh, products of say Office 365. So it's able then to know what uh, your meetings were about. It can generate the meeting notes from Teams meetings say, and, uh, and pull in information from um, your Word documents when you're writing emails or calendar invitations and so on and so forth. And if you just think for a second about how many people are using uh, Office products out there, like this, something like a billion people, uh, it's clear that this is a, a big deal. And it's of course not just for uh, Microsoft products. Google has uh, the si similar solutions uh, in their products. So here's an example from Ethan uh, Mollick. Like, What's urgent in my email? And then draft some replies to those urgent things. And you get reasonable results. Of course it can do this, right? <laughs> and this isn't like far off into the future. It's here now and it's uh, being rolled out more broadly um, as we speak. Okay, but um, that's, that's uh, text uh, related stuff, right? But this is also true for uh, image related stuff. Clearly, obviously you would integrate this with say Photoshop shop and um, for music generation, you integrate this with music generation software. So this is across the board integrated into existing products and tools. Okay, but this talk is uh, actually supposed to be about software engineering. So what about software engineering? Well, we are in for a roller coaster ride. We are of course also getting co-pilots. And as many of you have experienced, these are pretty good. So good that it's actually a little bit troubling because it's doing stuff that programmers, developers, software engineers are doing. And they can do it for us, at least to a great extent. So it's uh, almost a little bit funny how it's sort of something created by developers, software engineers, these uh, AI systems is sort of like uh, Paul Kodrowski is saying here, it's like a missile aimed directly at software engineering itself. Because uh, when you get this efficiency boost that you can sort of measure and experience, most importantly, yourself, um, what will happen to the jobs? Well, uh, it's a little bit unclear, of course. Uh, many people are speculating in different directions. My personal feeling is that the demand for software engineering is going to go through the roof because now uh, with these kind of tools, we can get even more things done with software and the demand is just going to be immense. So rather than drown in this wave as software engineers, we can surf, we can surf. And that brief overview of the current landscape of uh, AI brings us to our next point. To benefit from generative AI as a software developer and uh, including creating your own generative AI powered software, the first order of business is to be an effective user of generative AI. And to be an effective user, 
it helps a lot to have some understanding of how these AI tools work. And we'll turn to that next.